Um, let's come back to the studio. Uh, my guest still here, Ralph Schulhammer, who's a political uh, theorist and economist, and uh, also Sam Armstrong, who's a commentator. Ralph, uh, great to get you back in the studio. Now, we often talk to you about climate change issues, and I actually want to come on to a little bit on that, <laughs> because I think energy security is a factor in all of this, what's happening. But what, what do you make of where we are right now with Israel, with Hamas, with, with you know, EU leaders calling for a, a, a pause and a cessation of violence, with backbench Labour MPs here calling for uh, a, a, a pause and, a, and a, a ceasefire? Well, I think there are two things we have to distinguish. One, for, for Hamas and Israel, this conflict is about uh, Israel and Hamas, about their positions in the conflict. But of course, for everybody else, it's about containing that conflict. And uh, somebody, uh, something that the, the Member of Parliament said before, I think was quite important. He talked about the rapprochement between Israel and the Sunni world. There is no rapprochement between Israel and the Sunni world. There is, there was kind of a, a better relationship between Israel and the leadership of the Sunni world. We tend when, to... when you talk about the Sunni world, yes. explain, because obviously this is two different we talk about of, We talk about jo it, Jordan, Muslims. Saudi Arabia, particularly Saudi Arabia, yeah. Egypt, all these countries basically surrounding Israel. But there's a distinction we tend to forget in the West, which is that in these countries, very often what the leadership thinks is very different from what the people think. So Saudi Arabia, for example, Egypt, the same. These are regimes that stand on feet of clay. So yeah. what they are afraid of is if Israel and the, Israel has every moral right to make a ground offensive, absolutely. But what they fear is if you get pictures out of the Gaza Strip, yeah. if you have media like the BBC who go out pretty much with, I would say, fake news that Israel has been bombarding hospitals, mm -hmm. they are afraid that it will fire up their streets and that at some point you have a rerun of the Arab yeah. Spring, but then now getting to an energy question, but maybe then in Saudi Arabia. So, for example, if you yeah. would have hypothetically a uh, Islamist revolution, an anti-Western revolution in Saudi Arabia, that'd be a huge problem for everybody involved. Yeah. And this is kind of the, and that's the, the thing. moment You're right. We when we do talk about this, we talk about it as if Jordan thinks this, you know, um, Iran thinks this. You're talking about countries with huge populations where, as you say, the leadership, you know, despotic authoritarian leaders. And again, people, people say, why does the West back Saudi Arabia? Well, because look at the alternative. It's basically the Iranian mullahs effect. That's what you're looking at. Let me give you one quick number to highlight this. They did a poll in Saudi Arabia just one year ago and they asked the people, would you allow an Israeli prime minister to visit Saudi Arabia for an international conference? 7% said yes, and 93% said no, they don't want to have an Israeli yeah. prime minister set foot in Saudi Arabia. That's the reality on the Arab Spring. This is what we have to deal with. And that is also what Israel is dealing of with. Of course. Um, Sam Armstrong, it's, it's come to you. Um, it, it, we, we've discussed this a little bit earlier as well, of course, but again, these, these calls for people to say, like, the EU leaders or, or Labour MPs, some Labour front benches, when people are talking for a ceasefire, even a, a pause, now a pause meaning I think a few hours is normally the, the, the term people are meaning, um, but anything more than on that, when people are calling for that, it is playing into the hands of Hamas, isn't it? Why do you think people are doing that? Because what do people expect to happen afterwards? Like, OK, so we're going to pause, we're going to let some aid in, might let some people out. Well, you know, people have got dual nationality passports. Well, lucky for them. But what do they think happens after that? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, it's not a ceasefire, it's a surrender. Mm -hmm. Hamas has had its attack. Um, Israel needs to defend itself against that, remove the, the militants, command and control centres, weapon stores from the tunnels. But I genuinely don't accept, I don't accept that Sadiq Khan, for example, doesn't know this. Sadiq Khan must know that what he's calling for is for Israel to basically suck it up. His yeah. genuine belief is that Israel should, oh, well, it's not that bad, it's only 1,400 Jews. But, but also, look, we, we, we know you want to strike back and we understand why, but, but then everyone will say bad things about you and therefore, and therefore you shouldn't. I don't remember America worrying about that after 9-11. No, but he believes in a hierarchy of suffering. You've got to remember this. It's built into the left. He believes that one of the most, it's built into every left-wing textbook, every left-wing movement at universities, the most oppressed people of all are those in Palestine. And that's why they're prepared to ignore, for example, the plight of gay people in Palestine, mm -hmm. where the Hamas's penalty is very simple. They will kill you. Yeah. They're prepared to ignore all of the human rights abuses because Hamas... Is it's Palestine... This is actually a pl out, playing out of, of identitarian politics, but on a global scale. Uh, Ralph Schulhammer? I mean, there, there's something nobody wants to talk about, so I think but somebody has to say it. Let's look at the demographics of Europe. You have 4 million Muslims in Great Britain and 400,000 Jews. You have about 7, 8 million Muslims in France and about 500,000 Jews. Politicians know that, yeah. so they know what's happening in Israel uh, means that it, if they have to take sides, 
then if, which side do you well, think and they're going to And we are seeing take? that pull with, with uh, uh, clearly with Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, absolutely, um, and the backbench MPs, and the sort of outcry from from councillors and 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 not just the sort of the Corbynista left wing MPs, but many of as well. It's and the awful thing is, you know, which side is your bread buttered? Basically, are you going to lose those seats? And, and that is a real concern, isn't it? Because these things should be matters of principle, not about, you know, well, ooh, have we got more votes in that neighbourhood than that neighbourhood? And we know, of course, the Jewish population, I think it's actually lower than that. I, think, I thought it was around the 250,000 mark in this country and a higher population of, of Muslims, perhaps 4 million able to vote. I don't know, but... Um, but you are looking at the the Jewish population in this country in very you know North London and in Manchester in the vast majority living in Syria, and therefore not seeing that pressure, perhaps that that, that Labour MPs are getting from the much much wider uh, Muslim community. Well, principles pretty much went out of the window once the entire West signed up to the ideology of multiculturalism, which basically argues that every culture is the same anyways. Yeah. So there's no point in arguing about it. As we find out now, there are people in our countries that simply see the world differently. Well, well I mean, it's fascinating, actually. One uh, MP has talked about how they're concerned about facing, uh, facing violent threats. Uh, from people in his community and want you to speak out on the issue because of threats of violence. Now, are those threats of violence coming from, oh, I don't know, Israelis, uh, people supporting Israeli group, or from Jewish Brits? Or you know, And we all know what we're talking about here, don't we? When we see people on the streets having a vigil for people who have died in that horrific massacre on October 7th, there is no trouble, there is no concern, there is no hounding or calling for people to be, to be you know, to have revenge or call... When we see the, the, the protests on the street, and there's going to be another one this weekend in London and elsewhere, uh, where you've got um, a pro-Palestinian rally, that's a perfectly legitimate reason for people to go on the streets to support those people and make sure that they, you know, they, their needs are, are focused on. I've got absolutely massive respect for that. But we do see these protests. For some people, and far too many people, it, it veers outside the I'm concerned about innocent people in Gaza to... Israeli hate, hatred of Israel and hatred of, of, of Jews. And, and, and that is a concern because we've basically said, as you say, in a multicultural country, that's OK. And, and this lack of integration doesn't just stop there. We saw last year in Leicester when India and Pakistan got, went into war, you saw Pakistani community on one side, the Hindu community on another side, going into actual fights, streets, riots on the streets, and that's the trouble when you don't integrate communities into... Now, the society. conversation... Anyone, someone listening to this from, you know, on the left will go, oh, well, this is a horror... You know, three white people with your privilege talking about this nonsense, um, and it's all bigoted and xenophobic. Got no issue with anyone with any religion whatsoever. Couldn't care less about people's skin colour. I do believe, though, that if were I to go and live in Saudi Arabia, which I would not do because I would not be willing to do this, I would feel the need to integrate, to, to take on the values values and live that up. I just think that if you're going to live here, if you're going to raise your children here, you should, you should ascribe to the values of the country you've chosen to live in. No, and, and just to add on and to that this... That doesn't involve threatening people because they disagree with you. We, we have been told about 20 years ago that ideally Iraq should be broken up because Sunnis, Shias and Kurds cannot live in the same state because they're so different. And now at the same time we are told that it's no problem to have radical Islamists, Jews and, you know, liberal Westerners living in the same country where the differences are significantly bigger. I think we have to accept that, of course, if cultures hold different values and they live in the same society, at some point the risk of clashes and conflict is increasing. We see this all over the world. You're correct, right? You can always say, oh, this is just some white people who make this claim. But we see it. I'll give you one quick example. Sweden in 2006 had, I think, six murders. Now, as a consequence of the immigration policy, they have to send in the military into Malmö because they have gang wars with hand grenades, with dynamite. That simply didn't happen before. Now, again, one can say, how can you say this? Well, but this is, this is the game we've been playing for 20 but years. But these are facts. These are facts, and we're not supposed to talk about them. This is always about you can be factually right or you can be, quote-unquote, morally right. But I think if you constantly try to be morally right, you lose touch with reality. And this is what we see all and over the West. And people people on the ground, people living in, in European nations seeing this, we'll, we'll be seeing it. That said, I don't want a situation where people are in any way saying, oh, but because someone is of a particular faith or, 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 or ethnic or, or, or nation, national heritage, that they would subscribe, subscribe to this. Because actually the biggest victims of Islamist terrorists, whether it be Hamas or whether it be uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS, are actually Muslims.
They're the people that they harm the most. They are the biggest victims of this. I don't think that the vast majority of people of the Muslim faith do remotely support these people. I just think we've got a lot of so-called community leaders, self-appointed, who think it's in their interest to say they do. Uh, and cowardly politicians that aren't prepared to stand up to it. There's yeah. countless examples on Twitter of just shocking hate preachers yeah. spewing bile, absolute bile, about the Jewish community in this country over the past few days. All of them ha will have shaken the hand of their local MP over mm -hmm. the last few years. Well, and, and they not... should have misgendered them and then they would have been banned from Twitter. C quite. Hatred is hatred, and I don't care what kind of gown it's got on it. And by the way, a lot of them would be prepared, a lot of Labour politicians in particular, perfectly prepared to call it out when it comes from the Christian community. I don't care what... Well, we've seen Christian preachers preaching, si praying silently being arrested. I don't care what brand of religion you're coming from. If you are spewing vile threats, and I say this as a member of the Free Speech Union, if mm. you're spewing vile threats of actual violence against members of British communities, you should not be welcomed into the corridors of power, yeah, period. It's very, very simple, yeah. isn't it? Um, very no, final, quick yeah, word, perfect. I mean, but there's one thing we must not forget. The direction of a community is determined very often by the loudest minority and not by the silent majority. So if we say 90% don't yeah. want this, but 10% want it, very often the 10% call the shots and not the 90%. But this is where in all, in all, in all communities, oh, yes. every community, the quiet, the silent majority need to start speaking up. Very much. Uh, but I'm going to be very naughty. I want to come back to Ralph Shulham, but just briefly, because we've had you on previously talking about, you know, uh, just issues about the, the net zero costs mm -hmm. and the like. And I, I did want to get to it just really briefly. Um, when we look at things going on in the Middle East, one of the reasons why America decided to go for the fracking, cheaper energy, but also not not being reliant for gas on the Middle East. They've got, they're obviously a massive uh, oil exporter as well, I think the second biggest in the world, I yes. think. Um, there are concerns, aren't there? Things going off, you know, not just in Ukraine, we saw the impact on our economies from the, the Russian invasion. What well, goodness knows what's going to happen um, uh, with an invasion of Taiwan by China. But there are big concerns. If things go off in the Middle East, that is going to have a huge impact on our economy as well. What does that tell us about what our energy needs should be? Well, it tells you once again that if, if you try to depend on others, right, if these others turn against you, you have a problem. And you saw this, as you correctly pointed out. I mean, right now, as we speak, almost every European nation is making long-term LNG contracts with Qatar. Qatar the is one liquefied of the, natural gas. Exactly, as one of the major supporters of Hamas. So while we talk about solidarity with Israel, we basically fill the coffers of those who support and shelter the leadership of Hamas, that this is always the problem. Always look at what, what politicians do and not what, what they say, because unfortunately, very often, there's a huge difference.